Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. Now, a couple weeks ago, I did a video about robots, and I called it Metal Men. <laughs> and I intentionally used that wicked, old-fashioned gendered language just to see if I get a rise out of anybody, because that's the kind of guy I am. But at the same time, I like to explore other viewpoints, and this week I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk about women in science fiction. And I'm not going to talk so much about female writers. That's a topic for a different time. But I am going to talk about female protagonists. As I said, this video is about female protagonists. And whereas women have played an important role as characters in science fiction novels for a long time, they usually weren't the center of the story. Now, there's a dogma that women were really oppressed and discriminated against in the science fiction world, and I, I don't really buy that so much. It's true that female writers often took on unisex names, you know, like C.L. Moore, for example, or they adopted a male name such as Andre Norton, but that was because the publishers didn't think that men would buy a science fiction book by women, and men were the, the vast majority of science fiction readers at the time. I don't think they gave us enough credit, or at least our ancestors, because, you know, this was like the 1920s and 30s and 40s, so writers like this would often disguise their identity. However, there were there were writers like Leigh Brackett, who didn't hide the fact that she was a woman, and she was very popular in reading some of these sci-fi adventure stories. So I think that the publishers, they, they kind of underestimated the intelligence of the American male, I think. But moving on from that, even though there have been more female science fiction writers than most people believe, there have obviously been few female protagonists. And when I say protagonist, I'm talking about the central protagonist, like the number one character in the story. Uh, for example, uh, you talk about uh, a princess of Mars. This was written in 1917 by Edgar Rice Burroughs, the Tarzan guy. Now, the princess of Mars refers to Deja Thoris. Uh, she's a red Martian princess. <laughs> And she is a very strong and capable female character. She's intelligent, she can fight, but, you know, she gets outnumbered and kidnapped on numerous occasions, and she gets rescued by John Carter. Because really, John Carter is the central character of the story, and she is the love interest. She's an awesome love interest, but nonetheless, she's not the number one. So I don't think she counts. And that was... In that era, that was probably the best you'd get in a female-centric science fiction. You know, unless it was like a love story. <laughs> Even one of the very first science fiction stories written way back in 1818, uh, Frankenstein, the new Prometheus, <laughs> by uh, Mary Shelley, written by a young woman, but still all the important characters are male, because people would be scandalized or wouldn't believe it <laughs> if, like, uh, Victor Frankenstein had been a woman. That kind of thing. So it had a lot to do with our culture, more, th more that than any kind of uh, concerted effort to keep women down. At least that's what I believe. So I did a survey. So I wanted to do a survey to see how it had changed, how that role had progressed. Now, it seems pretty obvious that since around 2000 that it's been very egalitarian. If, if in fact, female protagonists have not possibly even outnumbered the males, uh, just in the effort to be politically correct, in an effort to uh, cater to a growing female audience, and so on. And sometimes um, young men who have a fetish for strong female characters. And so I wanted to look at the progression in the 20th century, so I wouldn't consider any of the more modern stuff. And in fact, a lot of steampunk being written since 2000 has been very female-centric, including some of my own that I wrote in in concert with Mrs. Desperado, which really helps really helps to write a female character if you have a female co-author. 
But going back to uh, science fiction and the progression, I found a list on Goodreads uh, called Best Science Fiction with a Female Protagonist. And uh, they got a little carried away because there's over, uh, over 1,300 books listed on there. <laughs> and most of them were since 2000. And there was also a number where the woman wasn't really that prominent. She was a prominent character, but she was out overshadowed by the men. I, I was looking for examples of women who showed how the role, role changed in, over the century. And it seemed to me, at least from what I could find, that there were really very few uh, before 1960. I mean, you would have the dutiful wife, or you'd have the sexy girlfriend, or, you know, the, the little girl in distress, that kind of thing. And they might be an important character, but they weren't the hero. I would consider it if the woman's the primary character, or one of two. Often you have a story where it's a brother and a sister, or a guy and his girlfriend, or whatever, that are doing the main action of the story. And so that counts, I think. So, you may be familiar with a guy named Joseph Campbell who wrote about the archetypes in fiction. And there are 12, including like the lover, the hero, the magician, the outlaw. And I think perhaps when he was writing that, he was thinking about mostly male characters because they mostly were. But at the same time, or there were archetypes, let's say, that were more accessible to female characters, like the lover, for example. Women are often you think of Wuthering Heights, for example, not science fiction, more like fantasy, but nonetheless. Whereas the hero and the outlaw and the explorer, rarely. But women were often the caregiver, or the innocent, or the sage, or the magician. They were rarely the ruler, although you did have exceptions, like Queen Victoria, for example. And the jester? Well, I think most jesters were men. Because <laughs> men are funnier, right? <laughs> well, maybe not always. So, as I consider these stories, I want to talk about the Bechtel test, which a lot of people in, in the fictional writing world know about. Uh, there's this uh, American cartoonist, she's a lesbian, uh, and she's called Alison Bechtel. She kind of phrased this, and had her characters say this, that uh, a story about women isn't good unless the women have other interests than men. <laughs> well, of course, she wasn't interested in men, but... She has a good point. I mean, if if a woman is just talking about her love interest or her husband or her boyfriend or some guy she's got a crush on, that's not really that's not really an independent female. I mean, of course, she's going to have a love interest, but she should have other uh, other interests in her life. I kind of looked at that idea when I when I talked about some of these stories, as people who were gals who were more independent in thought. So, starting back in the 60s with some YA juvenile books, uh, we start with Robert Heinlein, who uh, wrote a book called Pod Kane of Mars. Well, I really hate that name. It's such a stupid name. <laughs> but she was an interesting character. And she was a young gal who was raised on Mars, the human colony there. And she was excited because she gets a chance to go visit Earth. And the things kind of go awry, and she kind of has to play a heroic role. And it, what is cool about that is that he could have easily made this character a boy, but he didn't. And people characterize, especially females, especially women and, and uh, minorities, like a certain black writer, <laughs> who I shall not name, or call him a racist, and uh, call him a fascist, which is like entirely unwarranted. He was a very open-minded guy. He had some interesting opinions, but uh, that doesn't make him a fascist. And so I think books like this show that he wasn't. Another interesting book from the same time period, although one year earlier, 1962, and something, one of the first sci-fi books I read and got me into it as a kid, was A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline L'Engle. Here are the, the protagonist is Meg Murray, who is becomes kind of reluctant hero. She's a, she's a strong-minded girl as it, as it is, but her father disappears and, and she discovers he's been kidnapped by these evil other dimensional creatures who are, well, creatures that are like people, but they're kind of fascists for lack of a better term. <laughs> and 
She has to rescue him and little brother has been like possessed by them. And with the aid of some older, wise, sage, magician type characters who happen to be women as well. Well, they're not really human, but they're personified as women. And Langle said she had trouble publishing this book, and she thought it was because Meg is a girl and they wanted the publisher wanted a boy protagonist. I tend to disagree. I think the the thing is that Wrinkle in Time was so creative and it was so outside the box, and publishers, even though they tend to be a little left of center in America, they are also very conservative when it comes to money and profit. <laughs> and they really don't want to risk rocking the boat in, as far as, uh, you know, putting out something that might not sell. But in this case, I think it's because of some of her religious ideas, which were Christian, but not traditionally so. So she could not have found a Christian publisher wouldn't have accepted her either. So it took a while for a secular publisher to accept her. Nonetheless, highly recommended. Do not recommend the movie adaptation, but highly recommend this. We have to go jump forward into the 1980s when things had changed a lot. And I have to mention this one because the feminists will be disappointed if I don't. The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, published in 1985. And this was a time when Ronald Reagan was president and all the progressives were freaking out thinking he was going to bring some kind of dictatorship to America. They were very, very wrong. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, it's an interesting dystopian story and that it's a fundamentalist revolution that puts women back in the home and it's even worse because they're forced into breeding programs uh, like the protagonist whose name is Ulfred. <clears throat> She's a victim and I think, which makes her less interesting, I think she's a victim for the purpose of a feminist moral. <laughs> so, it, so, nonetheless, it's something you should read as an interesting idea, uh, as a concept, more than for her character. And female characters often had that role in the, during the 20th century as the transition went to more active characters with more agency. And one of the characters I like better she was still in a role where she was kind of uh, uh, stuck in this role, but far more interesting was Octavia Butler's book Dawn, in which a character called Lily Ayapo finds herself in this spaceship by herself uh, with no memory of how she got, got there. And she's actually uh, one of the last few survivors of the human race. And so she has to unravel this mystery. And I like her a lot better as a character. And Octavia Butler, she was an Afri African-American writer, uh, one of the few popular sci-fi writers of color at that time. Fantastic. Uh, so definitely check out her work if you get a chance. Here's a book I talked about in my last video about my favorite best science fiction novels of all time, and this is Neil Stevenson's Diamond Age. And her, his character, Nell, is another strong female protagonist. She's a young girl from kind of a white trash, impoverished family who becomes smart, capable, and uh, formidable. Partially because she gets this wondrous book that allows her to learn, but she does, she takes, takes control and she does it, which is what's so cool about her. Moving back a little bit to one of the pioneers, Anne McCaffrey. She had the Dragon Riders of Pern, a very great series. Uh, it sounds like fantasy, but this is science fiction because it's a, an alternate world where the dragons are alien creatures who bond with humans telepathically. The very first book, uh, Dragonflight, is about a woman called Lessa, who is a telepath and a natural-born dragon rider, and she has to be the hero to kind of save her people from an external threat that nobody believes her. And as the books go on, I have a male protagonist, I'm a female, but it's very interesting and compelling, compelling works. Now, as far as character protagonists, we not just have heroes, but we also have anti-heroes. And sometimes the anti-hero can be more interesting than the hero, or, it, or they can even be a villain <laughs> that, that is the central character. And one such is Joan de Vinge's The Snow Queen, published 1980. You may recall I talked about 
Werner Vinge, that's her ex-husband. The Snow Queen was based on a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, and the, the uh, Snow Queen was a monarch who reigned for a specific period of time, and it was supposed to be sacrificed <laughs> at the end of this period uh, on this world with this weird cyclical climate. And so she wants to hold on to power, and so she's very scheming, and she's kind of an anti-hero. But there's also female heroes as well in this book. Here's a fascinating book uh, by a writer that I just discovered by accident, and yet she was on this list. Sherry S. Tepper, who wrote a book called Grass in 1989. It's not about marijuana. <laughs> it's about a prairie planet, and where they have this unique culture where they hunt foxes, as in old days of England, but they're not foxes, and they, the, the creatures they ride aren't horses, and the ones that sniff out the foxes are not hounds. They're all alien creatures. And at the same time, there's this plague, and this young female scientist, she's a, I guess she's a sage, <laughs> perhaps an explorer, uh, Marjorie Westriding Yariar, <laughs> I can't pronounce it, and she comes to investigate why this plague hasn't touched this planet called grass. And it turns out that the, their weird culture and the plague are intertwined. And it's very f interesting how that plays out. And uh, Tepper, who's unfortunately deceased, she was viewed as a moderate feminist, which is the kind of feminist that I like. <laughs> Not the I hate men feminist, but the I, women deserve a break feminist, which is good. Uh, we have to proceed to a very female-centric series written by a man. This was David Weber's Honor Harrington series, which centers around a character called Honor Harrington. <laughs> and she is a female military commander in the Space Navy of her particular world. And the uh, first one was called On Basilic Station, where she's a commander. Later she becomes a captain. And she is in the military because of her family, and at the same time, she does face some challenges, although this world is fairly egalitarian, but some unique challenges as being a woman, because there's this guy who she went to the academy with who tried to rape her. She kicks his butt, good for her, but he's trying to ruin her. <laughs> he's an aristocrat, so, so he bounces back from that horrible thing, and he tries to ruin her. So she does face some uniquely female problems, but at the same time she is kind of a very masculine female character. So, perhaps not one of the best examples, but still an interesting series. Another one where we have a female anti-hero is C.J. Cherry's Cytine in, in 1988. Cherry is also a female writer. And Cherry's stuff, I find it a little slow, but it's well written and well imagined. And the Cytine books are about a world where there's a lot of genetic engineering and they make these clones for special purposes and they have to be trained in a special way. They're inherently a bit unstable for that reason. And the, the original protagonist is rather a evil conniving woman. She's a top scientist, so she's brilliant, but she's also abusive and, and manipulative. And so I like that. I like the example where a woman can be the villain as well. Uh, and I guess maybe males are afraid to write female villains, but women, female writers, are not. Finally, I have to give one more example. There's a ton of them, but, but I'm just trying to play the gamut to see how it progressed from the 60s through the 90s. And this one was William Gibson, kind of the father of cyberpunk. This is Gibson's most famous work called Neuromancer from 1984. And it involves three protagonists. Two of them are men, and one is a woman, Molly Millions. And she's kind of a cartoon. <laughs> Basically, she's kind of a cartoon, almost a fetishist character, because she's a very dangerous, she's a sexy but dangerous woman. And, and she's had this sort of history. She's worked as a prostitute for a while. And yet, and she's kind of a mercenary, and she has... Uh, sharp knives in her fingers that she can extend like a cat. And so she can she will seduce men and sometimes kill them because she has this ability. Uh, so she's a fascinating character, but definitely an anti-hero and uh, definitely 
more of a outlaw character. And I, I, I'll be blunt, I think it's fetishist. But I think some of the female outlaws kind of played that role in uh, science fiction and, and it kind of advanced the case of uh, more varying female protagonists. Finally, I have to address this one, which is a movie and which is not a book until they novelized it, but the Alien series, Aliens 2. Uh, and this is one of my absolute favorite scenes, my one of my favorite characters, uh, Ellen Ripley, uh, played by Sigourney Weaver, where she uh, kicks the female alien's butt uh, while wearing one of these uh, cybernetic uh, loader robot frames. And she's, I call her Mama Bear, because she's like protecting a child, which... I think a lot of men, particularly me, <laughs> a lot of us chauvinist men, I find that very appealing. So I, I have to have to do a shout out to Ripley because <laughs> she's fantastic. So this has been my survey of women as protagonists in science fiction. Please let me know what you think about it in the comments below. Please like and subscribe so we can get out the good steampunk word. We can talk about steampunk and other great science fiction and fantasy topics. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.